but you get this oscillation type behavior from this. Uh, now notice that I didn't program, when I made this program, I didn't tell it to oscillate. I only told it uh, the hooks law and the damping and this kind of stuff. So the fact that this string bounces up and down and oscillates, that just comes naturally. It just emerges from the system itself, from the simulation. And you can play with this. You can, if you imagine taking a string, if you pluck it over there, then the the, the wave will sort of fly back and forth like that. And it's fun to play with that. <laughs> now, uh, what else can I do with this? Well, if I so this this string is uh, well this long. I think it has about 54 dots in it. That's all I could really fit on the screen. Well, if I were to uh, fix one of those, uh, let's say, okay, maybe right there, right here. Uh, now I've made this string shorter. So this one uh, is colored like that. That means this one will not move anymore. So imagine that you have a guitar and you hold the string a little bit further down the neck, and then you pluck it here. Okay, what happens to that string? The string is shorter, and so when you pluck it, yeah, it only oscillates that shorter string, and the note will be different. The frequency will be higher, right? Again, this program doesn't know about that, but if you wobble that string, you can see that it's going faster than the one before. Or if I go to this side, uh, it's even faster than that. So again, this just happens naturally from the simulation. The program itself does not know about uh, the fact that it should go faster the shorter it is. It's just a natural phenomenon uh, that emerges from the system. The way that I put these to this fixed point here, this segment here should be about half the length of this one here. Okay. Uh, and I paused it for a second. I'm going to pluck this one and this one simultaneously. So what happens when I let it go? This one is twice as long as this one. So the frequency of oscillation of this one, if it was a real string, the frequency of this one would be half the frequency of that one. Okay. So let's see if the simulation agrees. I'm just going to slow it down a little bit. Looks about right. Yeah, it's about two times that uh, frequency. Again. Yeah, this one is wobbling twice as fast as the other one. So I find it interesting that this, this is a consequence of the, uh, of the model. It's not something that you, you need to add to the model. It just comes from those simple rules that we implemented in the first place. Uh, let me show one last. I'll play with this just a little bit more. Uh, if I put... If I were to pluck it like this, uh, maybe this is something you've seen before, I have it paused right now, but if you pluck it like that and then you unpause, uh, that wave will travel along the string like this. So this is what's called a transverse wave. It's like at the, the football match when all the crowd uh, does this wave. Whereas this one is a standing wave. Okay, so that's the that's not moving side to side on the string, the whole thing is oscillating like that. So you can sort of see both of those phenomena from this simple model. If you know how to program, you can make this program in a couple of hours. Okay, not difficult at all. And you can do all sorts of variations on it, you can play with it all you like. Any questions about 
this one. Before I close this. <laughs> Okay, let's go to another example. <coughs> By the way, this code is just for updating those objects. Well, then there is more code in the program to make the graphics, to make the window, to watch for mouse clicks and this kind of thing. So it's a little bit bigger, but this is the substantial part that has to do with the mathematics. Okay, let's look at a second example. Uh, so, let's take this system of planets and stars. So again, I'm just going to treat each planet in space as just a single particle. Okay, a single point with a mass and all these same ingredients here. So this time, in three-dimensional space, I've got some system of planets or stars or whatever, celestial bodies. Each one of them has a mass, position, velocity, acceleration, and force. And this time, oops, uh, this time the, the only source of force is the force due to gravity. So each pair of these particles will exert a force on each other in the direction uh, towards the other one. So for instance, this one will experience a force uh, towards that <coughs> planet or particle, and that one at the same time will experience a force towards that one, and at the same time this one here will experience a force uh, towards that particle and that one will experience uh, equal force in the other way. And of course those two as well will pull on each other. Okay, the, the equation for that force, if you have taken a basic physics course, you probably recognize this one. This is Newton's universal law of gravitation. Uh, it's, it is the order between the two particles or? Is the force, uh -huh, so th this force, on this particle, there will be an equal and opposite force here. Right. So this one as well. Same as that. Well, minus F1. And then over here, likewise, okay. like minus F2. But well, they are different in between each one. Yeah, each, each pair will have forces coming uh, right. towards each other. It's not, it's not the gravity of each particle. It's not the, the one? The gravity of each particle, right? It's more like. Yeah, right, the force between. Right. But if you look at each particle uh, individually, you can look at all the other particles and calculate the forces towards them, add them all up, and you get the total force on that particle. Oh. And then you do it for this one as well, and you do it for this one as well. And then you have them all. And, and again, from there, you can calculate the acceleration uh, by this equation, and then you can see how the system evolves. So again, the force of gravity, this is just equal to, this capital G is just a, a constant, this is Newton's constant, uh, times the, the mass of the first particle times the mass of the second particle, uh, divided by the, the distance between them squared. Okay, so mass of first times mass of second divided by the distance between them squared. That's Newton's law of gravitation. And that this just tells me the direction of that vector. It goes towards the other planet. <coughs> okay, so once again, you can calculate this, uh, or you can, you can program this uh, with a very short segment of code to implement that model. Again, all this, this part here simply calculates the forces the total force on each of those particles in the system, and then this part just updates the velocity and the position after a small time step. Uh, so again, don't you don't need to look and read and understand this code. I just want to give you the, the, the sense that it's very short and simple. 
Okay, so let's play with that one a little bit. Uh, so I wrote, again, a program for that. Okay, so this time it's a, um, a system of planets, and this is a three-dimensional view. So it's paused right now, but I can rotate the view and see those planets. I modeled this after our solar system. Uh, that's like the sun right here, the big one. Uh, that, if you can see it, is very faint. It's Mercury. Uh, here, Venus. That's Earth with a moon around it. <laughs> you can see it in a moment. Uh, here's Mars. That's Jupiter. And I stopped because the other ones are too far away. <laughs> Actually, it's very difficult to draw accurate pictures of the solar system because if you are zoomed out far enough to see all those things at once, they would be too small to actually see. Okay, so I drew them bigger than they actually are. So this is exaggerated. It wouldn't really be that large if you were seeing from this distance uh, and the same for all the others. Okay, so if we run this simulation so I unpause it and just you can just watch how the planets start to move uh, so it's exciting for a moment and then it gets <laughs> So I took the, the information for this model, I took it from the, the data I could find on the internet. So the, the distance between the Earth and the Sun is, is supposed to be accurate, and the same for all the other planets, and the velocities of them. It's supposed to be about what it actually is in reality. And so you can sort of uh, watch those planets go around. I'm just going to rotate the view so that we are looking from the top. So let's do that. Okay, so if you look from above, you can see that those planets, uh, maybe let's use a bright one like Venus, that's going around the sun, and it looks like in an ellipse. Not a perfect circle, but it goes in an elliptical uh, orbit with the sun as one of the focal points of that ellipse. So once again, the, the program I didn't code that into the program, it just happens from the simulation. Uh, it's an it's a emergent property that comes from the model that we use, just that over there. Uh, even better, if you watch closely and see how many times does Venus go around the Sun before Earth goes around the Sun one full time, it's about four times, a little more than four. And, and if you look at how many, how long is a Venus year, a, a year for Venus is about 88 days. So indeed, the, by the time one Earth year goes by, a little more than four Venus years go by, and you can see it happening here in this model. So it's, it's again, accurate. I didn't program that into the model, but it just happens. You can make that kind of prediction using the model. I'm going to change perspective, so let, at the moment this simulation is, the camera is pointed at the sun and focused on the sun. So I can change that, I can make it focused on the earth instead. So now the, the earth is sort of the center of attention, and it looks kind of like the sun is going around the earth, right? So a couple of things from this view, if you just kind of imagine that Venus or Mars is going you know, around the Earth, you can see that it, it happens in a very complicated way. It doesn't really travel anymore in an ellipse around the Earth. It kind of well, it goes around, but occasionally gets closer and slows down, maybe backtracks a little bit, like that. There's a little loop here, Mars a little bit of a loop.
So you can get this, the sense that um, a long time ago when people were trying to predict the trajectories of those planets and they were using Earth as the, as the center of the coordinate system, they would see some pretty complicated curves once they figured out how to plot those curves. And it was a big challenge to, to come up with the trajectory for a planet like that when it goes around and then backtracks a little bit. Uh, and they made a lot of efforts to try to mathematically model those kind of trajectories where the, the planet would do something like this. Okay. You can come up with mathematical equations for that kind of a curve, but it's much more complicated than an ellipse, for instance. And uh, again, this is what you can sort of see when you, when you play with this model a little bit. When you change your attention back to the sun as the center, uh, now the motion of those planets is much simpler. Uh, going back to Earth for a moment, uh, so you can also see how in, as this model goes forward, you can see those moments when, say, Venus is pretty close to Earth. Okay, Again, it's not that close, don't worry. Uh, and these are drawn bigger than they actually are, uh, just so that you can see them. But anyway, it gets a lot closer than it is right, like right now, it's quite far. Not so long from now, it will be pretty close. And those are the times when people who look at the sky, the astronomers, they get excited and they say, look, you'll find Venus very bright in the sky because, well, they ran a simulation or they did a calculation and they saw that it's as close as it will ever get today and uh, you better look to see it by chance. They do that with planets and also with comets and all these kinds. 